Hello, welcome back. Our second speaker today is Karol Przybylski. Now, Karol works as a research and development engineer, and he's involved in hardware <coughs> verification of Nokia's 5G telecom modules. His interests are embedded technology and applications. In his spare time, he likes to search for absurd humor and play story heavy games. Now, a word of warning, speaking of absurd humor, during this presentation, you are going to see at least one cat. Other than that, effective code review. Carol, take it away. Thank you for your warm introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this presentation. My name is Karol Przybylski, and this is Effective Code Review. I will be talking about my own experiences with code review process and how to make it a little bit better. In the first part of the presentations, I'm going to talk a bit about general issues regarding code review. In second part, I will be talking about some automated tooling. And the third part will be more soft skilled oriented. So in the case of me versus code review, I am judge, jury and the prosecution. I work as an R&D engineer at Nokia. I like tinkering with embedded hardware and software. And my favorite burger sauce is mayonnaise and peanut butter. And I know some of you will say that this is disgusting, but believe me, it's actually pretty good. Y you have to try it. If you have any follow-up questions, don't be afraid to hit me up on my email or wherever else for a follow-up discussion. So let's also cover what is not on the agenda today. I will not be talking about the rules that we all know. If something is easily Googleable in five seconds, or maybe you can ask your teammate about advice on, on the code review, then go ahead and do it. I will not be talking about something you can easily Google. Also, I will not be giving any language specific hints. If I have any examples, they will be Python oriented. But other than that, no language specific. My presentation is pretty abstract. Also, I don't want to talk about things you can find in every style guide. If you want an example of good style guide, you can Google C++ style guide used in Google or something like this. It's very, very easy to find and I recommend you to give it a read. And uh, let's start with some small questions. You can ask this question yourself or you can air your grievances in the chat. Do you enjoy doing code review? Do you wake up in the morning thinking about those five big fat reviews waiting for you? Do you enjoy this process? I have some predictions about what the answer will be. And I think that the consensus among developers is that code review is not enjoyable but it is essential. And actually, one of my very good friends uh, in my team compared code review process to waking up in the morning. You know you have to do it. It is an essential part of your day. You have to get up, go to work, earn money, do stuff, whatever. But you just don't want to do this. You keep pushing it and pushing it farther away. You hit that snoo snooze button multiple times. But in the end, you always just know that you have to do it. And it's very similar with code review. So since we all know that code review is essential, let's ask ourselves the question, why is it essential? And in here I have a quite interesting example of the Cluster Spacecraft. The Cluster Spacecraft was a project of European Space Agency of a spacecraft that was supposed to be launched in French Guiana, go to the magnetosphere of the Earth, and conduct some uh, scientific exp experiments there. It was a very, very expensive project. It took many years of R&D, planning the experiments, designing the spacecraft, spacecraft ev and, ev and everything. However, 37 seconds after it's launched, the spacecraft veered off of its course and landed straight into the ground, as you can see on this beautiful picture. And it cost 370 million dollars in losses. Many hours of designing scientific experiments just went to waste. It was a very, very costly mistake. And as you maybe are thinking now, the reason for this was a software error and a very simple one. The cause of this was the overflow. Overflow is basically computer science 101. 
everyone who has ever programmed anything has met with a condition of overflow. And it's very, very basic. It seems that on certain developer level, I it's just too easy to make such mistakes, but yet people do it all the time. And the demise of cluster spacecraft was overflow. And let's now examine how did this happen exactly. So first of all, a data conversion of 64-bit floating point to a 16-bit signed integer value occurred. That was the overflow that happened. Then the operand error was not an anticipated by the ADA code. ADA was the language of embedded systems. Back in the day, it was a bit rival to the C. However, obviously, C1 and C++, but it was still a bit popular in the day. And this operand error caused the system was not able to recover from software error. The software completely locked hardware. It locked the, s the first processor and it locked the backup processor. Also, the initial reference system was shut down. This system was the component of the spacecraft, of the hardware of the spacecraft, that was supposed to keep the spacecraft on its course, but it failed, it shut down, and then it went straight to the ground. There was also a plethora of other issues with this spacecraft, aside from the overflow and everything that occurred after. So there was design mistake because software was able to completely lock hardware. This should have never happened. This is just bad design. There should be a way to recover, maybe on the backup processor, but in this example, both the first and backup processor just failed. Also, there was requirements mistake because the failing code was actually a part of that code from the previous project. It, it was, it was just copy-paste. This code wasn't even supposed to do anything, and yet that was the part that failed. And management mistake. They all, all, almost always go with, with each other. Inconsistent code, flawed review process. It all led to this disaster. And the conclusion is following. Would code review have saved it? Now, I don't have an answer to this question. I don't know. It's not stated di directly in the report if code review, if a pros proper process of code review would have saved this project. However, as you know, the integer overflow condition is, is pretty simple. Maybe if someone had looked at the code and looked at it very, very carefully, they maybe it would have been spotted, but it wasn't. However, one of the good things that followed after was a large scale static code analysis. It was biggest at the time. It was early 2000s and every single line of code had to be analyzed in order to prepare a report. So a lot of backfinding tools and static code analyzers, analyzers were born after this accident. So another conclusion that we can draw from this is that you should automate every single thing that you can because people make a lot of stupid mistakes. People are often the most valuable asset of a, of a company. And we are not g good at doing repetitive, boring things like checking formatting rules, class variable names, commit messages. All of those tasks can be made by a machine because it's repetitive, it's boring. You can put a regex into your commit message checker and just leave it like this. Don't waste precious human potential on something that can be done by the machine. So leave all of the boring stuff to them. It will serve your time and you know, it's just good. Also, machines can replace you as being the bad cop in your team. It's pretty important because when you wake up and you see a message like this, so your review just got 39 comments, it's not looking good. And also I, as a person who writes those comments, I'm not feeling good. In this case, most of the comments were about formatting rules, class names, and so on and so on. So even though the comments are pretty small and insignificant, many of them make me feel like the bad guy, you know? The, I'm 39 issues to one person, it's too much. They will hate me after a while. So you can just leave this to the machine and let her, the machine, be the bad guy. Instead of writing 39 comments, you could write four comments and rest leave to the machine. And if you are looking for an inspiration of where to find stuff that will check a everything for you, you can use GitHub Marketplace. Now, this is a screenshot that I have made 
some days ago, and there's so much stuff in there. You have things for chat, code quality, code review, continuous integration, continuous deployment, every single thing. Also with the machine learning, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Even sometimes I wonder if maybe if I downloaded them all, all every single plugin available, maybe the project would be coded and reviewed and deployed by itself. Or maybe you could do it like in Skyrim. Keep downloading and installing plugins until your repository crashes. Very good source for inspiration. Or you can just use Jenkins with plugins. The, the possibilities are basically limitless in this case. And uh, if you are talking about Jenkins and continuous integration in general, I actually have a personal story involved uh, with my team when we were trying, when we finally did introduce continuous integration in our team. And I have to build this up a little bit before I get to the meat. However, my team and also Nokia, but mostly my team, was going through a period of changes shortly before and I joined Nokia in 2017. And as someone has said, to improve is to change. So all of those changes were good, but there was a lot of them. Like we were moving from SVN to Git, first GitLab, then Gerrit. So for those of you who experienced such transformation, you know that learning a new workflow, a new tool always takes a bit of effort and as VN versus Git, there's a lot of differences and you have to remember about it. You have to learn new things. Also, we are moving from our programs written mostly in Trickle, C, Python and some Bash to as much Python free as possible. Again, this was very, very good change. However, if you want to learn a new language or deepen your knowledge in new language, you have to give it time. You have to commit many hours in, in order to get better at programming in this language. Also, we had our custom test executor, which was based in Tickl, but we were moving to the Eclipse based one. And you know, you could say that now basically everyone knows Eclipse. However, this software still is very, very big. And for someone who has never used it before, it can take quite some time before he or she is able to leverage all of the func functionalities. And on top of that, Nokia itself was going through a series of enterprise changes. So we were going in hardware software development from mostly waterfall style of project management to something more agile. So if you want to hear more about it, you can revisit my talk about this issue from the last year. So you, um, you might ask yourself, where is the continuous integration? Where is the CI in, of the in all of this? We have so many fun new tools, but CI is also a very important piece of, of the puzzle here. So we also were asking us a question, how can we implement CI and get people to use and like it? And you might say that, hey, they don't have to like this. It's it's job like any other, you know? You just get told that you from now you have to use CI and there, there is no choice. However, in these circumstances, we were also in during the crucial flagship project. And there was also those many changes that I was talking about on the previous slide. So we couldn't just say, hey, use it from now on. Because at our team, there were many s more senior engineers working and having so many changes is sometimes hard for people. So we wanted to make it as seamless as possible for everyone. And the flagship project was actually this. This is RSK module used in modern Enode Bs that we were uh, developing in R&D at the time. So in order to introduce CI seamlessly, we decided to, to use a mix of Jenkins, Pylint, and gamification. And it turned out to be quite a good solution. So first of all, let's talk about what is gamification. Maybe some of you has heard this term, maybe not. And it is defined, as it says in this very, very interesting study that is listed by, by down below. I recommend you to watch it. 
gamification is application of game design principles in a non-gaming context. So we are not making a game, we are not developing a game, but we are taking the fun parts of playing a game and applying it to our business in order to make people like some process more or to sell mo more stuff to your clients. We are only taking the fun stuff and using it for, for our purposes. Because gamers, when they are playing a game, and I think every one of you has at some point in their life played the game, gamers are, are engaged and they want to play the game. You know, in their free time, they are not getting paid for it unless they are doing it competitively. So we want to recreate this feeling in gamification. And the examples of gamifications are, for example, game achievements, badges, or redeemable points. They are pretty common, they cost nothing, they don't give you any real-life advantage, and yet it's very, very fun to get them and to earn them. And we also, in order to understand gamification, we also have to ask ourselves a question, why do we play games at all? Why do we bother? And in this second very, very interesting study, going into deep depths of gamification, we have two things. We have motivations behind playing a game and what makes games engaging for us. So first of all, the motivations. The motivations are two. First, there's extrinsic motivation, the rewards. So when you are playing a game for a longer time, you are putting much effort into it, you are gaining, for example, achievements. And you feel good about achievements. Everyone likes to be rewarded, everyone likes to be appreciated. So this is one of the motivations. Then later you can show those achievements to your friends or whatever and, and gain even more respect. Then we have intrinsic motivation and that is satisfaction. So if we are putting a lot of effort into something, a lot of hard work, we are trying to be as good as possible and we finally overcome some challenge, then we are feeling satisfied. For example, you were fighting a boss in the game for 16 hours and at the end you had to learn a lot of new things. You have to apply them in the game. And after beating this boss, even though it changed absolutely nothing in the real world, you are more satisfied. And the engagements are actually caused by three things. Challenge, fantasy and curiosity. So challenge is di directly related to the difficulty level of a game. The more difficult the game is, the more challenge it gives you. And if you finally overcome this challenge, you are feeling a lot of satisfaction. It applies to everyone. Then there is fantasy. Fantasy is related to the situations where you are playing a game and, for example, you are using some in-game skill. You know, you are fighting dragons or something like this, casting a spell. And it's it relates to the things that are happening in a player's mind. Now, instead of being a boring developer, you are a mage fighting drago dragons. And it's fun. It's fun to imagi im imagine such things. And then there's curiosity. So people have natural tendency to like to listen to stories. We want to know more about the characters, what happens, and we, we want to know more about the, about the world. So if a game puts us in a situation where we don't know everything about the world we are in, then we are curious, we want to learn more, we want to get more knowledge about this. And also, when the source of the positive information is yourself, it is renewable. If you as a human being is the source of positive emotions, then you can repeat it and gain even more satisfaction and just feel happier in your life. And this is one of the illustrations of gamification, challenge and curiosity. So in this particular game, a player attained certain score, so 200 something stars and the, the top score is 350. So for many people, not everyone, but for many people, they will just say that, man, I have to repeat this level. I have to play this again, this again, because I want to get all of the stars possible at this level. We have our inner completionist that will not rest until all of the stars are gathered. And who knows, maybe if you get all of them, you get some new weapon or new skin. 
You don't know. So you want to satisfy this challenge. You want to beat the game. You want to get all of the stars. And also you are curious what happens if you do get all of them. And you want to leverage those feelings also in our CI. Challenge and curiosity. So then we have the second part of the, of the mix that is Pilint. So Pilint is an open source static analysis tool. It's very, very popular uh, among Python developers. It's very, very good. It checks for a lot of stuff. Formatting errors, code smells, other errors, refactoring tips, and so on and so on. It's very, very highly configurable. So you can do almost everything with it. Write regex for class checking and name checking, calculate a score. It's pretty good. And we wanted to integrate this with Jenkins. And in order to integrate it with Jenkins, we had to use a Pilint plugin. And actually, it's not Pilint plugin, but next generation warnings plugin that you can see at the bottom of the presentation. It's rather easy to integrate with Jake Jenkins and with your project. And it its biggest advantage is that it, it's that it gives you a very, very clear report of your errors. Everything is listed, every single mistake that you've made, it clearly points you to the line in your code where you made the mistake. You can see it, check it, and it's very, very easy. Like this. You shouldn't have used that name, use another name. Very easy. And now let's get to the basics of implementation of our system. So first of all, a change is pushed to Gerrit in order to be reviewed. Jenkins pulls the change, so the bot that is behind Jenkins. The Jenkins bot performs pilot analysis of submitted code, so it scans all of the changed files. So he looks at what files were in the project in the previous commit and which are in this commit. And with this difference, he gets the number of files that he has to scan, line by line, checking for errors. Then a pilot score is posted to the review page. Because Pilint has a feature that it, ca it can calculate a score of how good the posted code was. And the calculation is performed in the pipeline script and in Pilint RC. And it looks like this. So you have evaluation is the Pilint score that you are getting at the end. It can never be greater than 10. The biggest weight is put on errors, then warnings, then refactoring and convention. So it's from minus infinity towards 10. 10 out of 10 is the best code that you have ever seen. And then 5 out of 10 is meh, then 0 is worse, and under 0 it's pretty bad. So we introduced it like I have just told you, and of course at the beginning we had some initial problems, because I thought that, you know, we are great programmers, we are going to just get 10 out of 10 all the time. However, it did not look at this. First changes were more like this. And you can also see that here the, the implementation of hyphen is actually not very successful because it looks like minus minus. So that would give you a plus, but it's actually minus. Minus 8 out of 10. It wasn't very good. A lot of people, somewhere, some people had better scores, some worse. And uh, that is my personal record. So minus 900 over. I was merging some third-party code to our repository. It wasn't written by me, of course. And uh, yeah, minus 900 is pretty, pretty bad. It's almost on the verge of being impossible to, to fix. However, after some time, we've noticed that the gamif gamification principle started working because people on their own started to push new changes because they were seeing that the score that are they are getting is not 10 out of 10, it's something else. And they wanted to get this 10 out of 10. So they were on their own checking the report because it, it was very easy to check it. They were checking the report, checking the errors they've made and pushing new change. Remember, it wasn't mandatory because we had a lot of deadlines and we were rushing towards the end of the project. So they were doing this on their own and finally the effect was pretty good. You know? Soon after, we could introduce the mandatory rule that all code has to be 10 out of 10. But using this gamification technique, along with very good plug plugins, allowed us to introduce our CI seamlessly and later scale it. 
And there are a few important notes that we have to remember. First is that we you should clearly communicate the gamification results. So posting message. This message is being posted to the review page of your code. And uh, you can see here it's not very good. It just says starting analysis and that then it says failure with a link to the rev to the report. So you don't know anything. You don't know if you are 10 out of 10 or 5 out of 10. So there's no feedback to the user, so nobody will bother to use it. So you have to remember to make it better, to present this in easy way for, for the people. In here, you can see that the message is posted, your pilot's code is 10 out of 10. Your pilot's code is 5 out of 10. So the person most, lik most likely will get curious what mistakes did he do or she, and he will check it and then Thanks to the clear communication, it will be just better for everyone. However, I think we all know that bots can't do everything. As you can see from the sad robot, he is sad because he knows he can't do everything. Computers are dumb. They just can calculate stuff quickly. So we have to turn to people for the help. And actually, it can be proven that bots can't do everything. In here, I have a very, very interesting study that compared the backfinding tools to the review effects. Basically, the scientists took uh, free backfinding tools and applied it for several open source projects written in Java, and they had the following conclusions. Backfinding tools detect a subset of the defect types that can be found by a review. Dynamic tests find completely different defects than backfinding tools. Backfinding tools have a significant ratio of false positives. And backfinding tools show very different results in different projects. So taking all of those into account, we can clearly see that you can never replace a good code review process with machine that just checks for errors because it's ha it has so many issues. You can check this study for, for more about this, but only when you take the people who will do review will answer questions about design, ab about some more complicated things. And then you take the machines that are performing the bug finding and uh, static code anali analysis. Only then can you merge them together and have something that will produce a good piece of software. So now that we know that we have to turn to the people to the rescue and Another colleague of mine said once that he did not become programmer in order to talk to people. But unfortunately, in order to produce good code, we have to sometimes talk with each other and communicate clearly. And to make it easy, we have to answer another question. What is code review? So code review is communication. Communication is talking with people. And code review is art of talking with caring, but sometimes difficult people. Because when we care about our job a lot, we are sometimes starting to get defensive about, about our ideas. And sometimes we are difficult to work with. So code review is often an art of talking with difficult people, communicating them. And most people in lower or higher doses have actually a type of mindset that they have. They think that it is possible to create perfect software. My brain cannot be wrong. If I don't find any errors, then I have created perfect software. My code is me. Anyone who criticizes my code criticizes me. And you have to realize that these are, are all lies. They are just not true. I think the worst one is my code is me because I've seen it a lot of times and also I see it in myself often because when you care about your work, when you put a lot of effort in it and then someone comes and criticizes you, you will not like it. And if someone says that, your, hey, your for loop is dumb, he's not saying that your loop is dumb, he's saying that you are dumb <laughs> and you just have to forget about this mindset and you have to apply the correction to this mindset and that is. Software has mistakes. You are not your code, but you are responsible for the errors. 
and you can never never eliminate all errors only reduce their probability and you can combat these issues by communication it's the easiest way and it works most of the time if you know how to do it right and those things are actually excerpts from very very good book by Z show learn C the hard way mostly it's about C but also he gives some tips on uh, how to deal with people so our goal when we are in the process of code review is to do not provoke non-productive conflict because non-productive conflict is something that can destroy entire teams if you have non-productive conflict then you don't want to work with each other instead of talking you start screaming at each other it's not a good environment to work you want to not have it at all costs and you also want to create environment of mutual learning because code review is a very good tool for this if you are invited for review on so of someone else's code you can see how this other person is doing things maybe he's doing something better maybe he knows some techniques that you don't know it's very very good tool for this and you also just want to match the goddamn change because we are all at work we want to get our work done we want to match the change put our ticket into the done column and be done with it and not rage merge and it's also worth to remember that it's not about all about error checking in code review in there was a interesting study performed uh, by the guys that are listed below on the slide and they conducted a study among more, more than 800 developers at Microsoft in which they ask about the developers motivation behind doing code review and let's take a look at this you can see that the first two positions are pretty obvious it's finding defects and code improvement Th that's why we do it I it's the basic reason and also most of the management also tells that's why we do code review to get rid of the bugs however take a look at third and fourth place alternative solutions and knowledge transfer so people are not doing code review only to check for errors but they want also want to learn that they want to do as much of self-development as possible it's also very very important for them and we have to remember about this so let's not make a code review a chore but a way to develop our programming skills so now let's get to the bottom of the communication and let's learn how to write comments because the pen is mightier than the sword and it all begins with words so first of all please no exclamation points I can't actually believe that I have to tell this but you wouldn't believe how many times I had problems with this so when someone gives me a comment with exclamation points I will interpret it as screaming and when someone is screaming at me I will start screaming at them and this will be just a spiral of violence going all the way up and I will read all of your comments people read all of the comments please reserve one exclamation point only for life and death situation also don't use, use caps lock because it's also screaming and maybe you have been wondering why caps lock is screaming so here's an answer here is the first post from not internet but, but intranet that dealt with the issue of caps lock L take a look at the date 1984 back then people were starting to think why caps lock is interpreted as screaming and it was consensus at the time that caps lock is screaming and you shouldn't scream at people unless you want to but i sh want to believe that you don't want to scream at each other in comments during code review then you have to remember that you should always feed comments to the person because when you are talking with someone less experienced that someone new in your team or whatever then you should be as verbose as possible explain to them more stuff than to someone who you have been working with for years and someone who trust for example instead of writing just this can be optimized you can write this can be optimized like this so if someone has an inefficient for loop 
in his code. If you trust him, if you know that he's able to research and so on, then you can just say optimize this. But if you know that person might be struggling, you can help them out. Be more verbose. You all will you will all learn something from this. And also, if you have some good sources of knowledge, because you are more experienced at something, you should always cite them. So, for example, in Python, you will s write a comment to someone that, hey, you should use assert keyword for this. And of course, this person will go to Google and check the first result for the assert keyword. And we all know that very often the first few results from Google can be crap. So if you are more senior member of your team, if you know more something about a particular issue, you can give them sources in order to learn. So, are, so they will be become better programmers and your job will also be easier. And also if you are talking about seniors, this post from Stack Exchange actually highlights why it, I it is so important to com communicate very, very nicely. So developer in this post had a problem with code review, basically that more junior members of his team were not doing review of his code. So let's read it. At a previous company, I had a manager who would have to intervene from time to time. Once he raged merged all my pull requests that were open for more than two weeks because the rest of my team was not reviewing my work. And I especially like the raged merge expression I started using it a lot after reading this. So the advice given to this person was that maybe his teammates were afraid of doing his code review. And it often happens if you have a super reviewers in your team. And they might be afraid to, to challenge you. So you have to communicate with them, show them how to do it, guide them through process, and then they, they will learn on, on their own. So now that we know how to write, com write comments for the review, let's uh, talk a bit about how to talk to people. Because that's the fastest way of communication. You can write comment, you can write comments all day, but you know, it's easy to get lost in the comments. It's way easier for us to express ourselves in speech than in writing. So first of all, you have to listen. That's actually not related to talking, but it's very, very important to listen to others because we all want to be respected. We all want to be listened to. And it's not easy to listen, but once you get the patience to do it, it will pay off a lot because you don't know what other person is thinking. You might think that you know, but until you listen to another person, you will not never know this. The more you listen, the more you learn about other people's motivation, problems, goals, and so on. So here, this subject is very, very broad, but here are some few tips that you can use when you are talking with people to listen better. First of all, defer judgment and rebuttal. So how many times in conversation did you have a situation when you are talking with someone in a heated argument, maybe about something that you both care about, and instead of listening to other person, you start thinking about your own response. Response: Oh my God, how am I going to respond to the problem? You are not listening to him or her. You are only thinking about yourself. And it's a very, very big sign of disrespect when you are only thinking about yourself. So let people finish what they are talk, what they are saying, and then start talking on your own. Because that way you will just learn more. And you will not have two people monologuing, but two people talking with each other. Also, show that you are listening. You should give feedback to other person. That's called active listening. And actually, it's a very, very broad subject. You can check out more in the sources that I have below in Never Split the Difference and Having Difficult Conversations. It's a very big subject. You could have a 30-hour lecture only about this. But I just wanted to spark your interest in this topic. And also remember that we wouldn't have any electronics without feedback. You know, the output gives information to the input and input changes. So if we can't have any electronics without it, then maybe we also can't have 
conversations without feedback. And also remember to listen, not to be polite, but to learn about other person or other people. There, I there is a saying I once read that if you have learned nothing new during a conversation, nothing surprising, then you didn't have a good conversation. You can learn a lot about people you are working with just by listening. What are their problems? What are their goals? What do they feel about you and their work? It's very, very useful. Then we cannot forget about smiling because in Western culture, at least that's the culture I was born in and raised, we trust smiling people. And trusting people are cooperative people. And it's actually proven by science that smiling feels good when we are talking to a smiling person. And there's actually a very interesting study conducted seeing is believing the effects of smiling among the people. And the scientists took a bunch of students, like they, like they often do in the experiments, and they showed the students two images. One with a man who is smiling, and another man with a man who is frowning. And they asked students which one of these persons is more cooperative, trustful, easy to work with, angry. There were also other things, but those were the most important. And guess what? It's easy to say smiling person was, for the students, more cooperative, trustful, easy to work with work with. It's just natural for us. We are doing it on our own. Also in later stage of this experiment, students actually could gamble money against frowning or smiling people and they were giving more money to smiling people. So, you know, there's a reason why in every single commercial of a product, in every single advertisement there are smiling people because smiling people make us feel good about ourselves. It tickles our, our neurons in a way that makes us happy and co cooperative. And also, let's not forget about the tone of our voice. It's also very important, but people very, very often forget about it. It's not just what, but also how. Because it's very hard to process what another person is telling us. It takes a lot of processing power in order to process the sense of the words. But it takes very, very small amount of processing power to tell if someone smells bad, if he's smiling, if he's talking in a nice way, or, or how she or he is looking. It's very, very important. We are analyzing, our brains are analyzing whole package, not just the content of, someone, of what someone is saying. So it's important to remember that voice is a base of understanding and that we mirror each other. Almost from the day that we are learning social interactions, we are hardwired to mirror one another. So if some person is smiling and you are talking to her, you are also starting to smile. If some person is talking in a calm voice, then you will also start talking in a calm voice. That's just who we are. And if you will master smile and calming voice, then you will become the ultimate, gu ultimate guy everyone would like to work with. That's Bob Ross. For those of you who don't know who that is, he was a painting tutor who had a very, very popular uh, show about where he was teaching people how to paint. But I've read that 19% of people watching this show never even started to paint. Among them was were also me, because I, I would never start to paint. I, I don't want to take up such, such ac activity. But with him, it was just a joy to listen to his voice and his smile. He was a very positive person. And if you could choose to work with Bob Ross or anybody else, then most likely most people would choose Bob Ross. That's a perfect example of why, smi of why smile and calming voice works for everyone. And also there's a bit of negotiator's advice on how should we talk with people written by Chris Voss, a very experienced negotiator. So according to a negotiator, we should have three voices available. The first one is the voice 
of a late night DJ, deep and calming. If you have never listened to the radio at night, then that explanation should be enough for you. You know, it's night, everyone is tired, at least most of the people. So the DJs at the time have deep and calming vo voices. This voice calms other people. It's very, very useful. And also, you should have a positive and playful voice. It's laid back, encouraging. That's the type of the voice that you are using when you are talking with your friends. It's encouraging. People want to work with you. They want to do stuff. It's, it's pretty useful. This voice should be the most used by you when talking with someone. And there's, there's the third type of voice, which is direct, assertive, dominating. This voice requires control from someone. And people will listen to you for a while. But, you know, if someone is requesting a control from us all the time, then we are getting just tired of it. And, and it's nobody likes to work with some people. Positive and playful voice is what you should use all the time. And if you want to calm someone down, then you should just start talking slowly, calmly. Just imagine you are having a radio night for a very tired people that want to sleep and use the voice like this. No, instead of being silent, obviously. And my key points that I hope you will remember from this presentation is that you should automate everything. Automate as much stuff as you can because people make stupid mistakes. And machines are better at repetitive and boring stuff. Also, play video games. It's not just for fun, but you are learning about gamification, so it's just just play video games. Also be polite, especially when you are on the brink of meltdown. And believe me, I know that keeping your voice calm and smiling when the another person annoys the hell out of you is very, very hard and it takes a lot of practice to master it. But believe me that it will pay off. Also listen and respect others. Because everyone wants to be respected, everyone wants to be little listened to and appreciated. Also remember to smile, because smiling tickles the good neurons in everyone's brains. And speak like a late night radio host, because everyone likes such type of voice. And lastly, remember that real code review was the friends we made along the way. Thank you. Karol Przybylski. Karol, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, code review. I'm going to announce a break now, and I'd like to take some of your advice. So first of all, I'm going to smile. And then which voice would you like? Encouraging. Encouraging. OK, everyone, let's take a break. Don't go away, please, and do come back. I'd like to announce a break, but please do come back, because we're going to have another wonderful presentation. And I'm going to finish my sentence not with an exclamation mark, but with a decent and polite full stop. <laughs>